Welcome everyone to another one of our Ask an Expert sessions. Hope you're having a fantastic day today and a very special hello to our viewers on LinkedIn. This is the first time we're going live on LinkedIn. I can And I can already see a few people on LinkedIn saying, hey, our classic Ikea, hey, so hey back to you. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Today, I have a very special guest. I'd like to welcome back the Ikea Foundation CEO, Per Hagenis, and he's gonna introduce us to his very special guest. Per, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, and uh, I'm so looking forward to this because uh, I'm so impressed by the person that we are about to speak to. So welcome back everyone to Ask an Expert series where we uh, normally would feature one of our partners and the great work that they do to improve the lives of children and youth living in vulnerable communities around the world. Partners who all receive funding from our foundation. Today, however, we will have the pleasure of speaking to the CEO of Inca Group, the Jesper Brodin. Um, Inca Group provides all the funding for IKEA Foundation. Inca Group is the largest franchisee of IKEA. They own and operate 90% of the stores worldwide. And without Jesper and his team, we would not be able to support our 120 different partners in their important work. So Jesper has spent 25 years with IKEA, starting out in Pakistan. And as far as I remember, I think he was the only applicant for the purchase manager job there when he started. And yet, see what's happened since then. He is now ended up running a 37 billion dollar, sorry, 37 billion euro corporation with 166,000 co-workers, 374 stores in 30 markets around the world. Yes, very welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot for taking the time to join us for Ask an Expert. So yes, but I know in my 11th years as CEO of the IKEA Foundation, or for many of those years, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with you on, on different projects. Uh, you've always shown a great interest in the foundation's work. Why is that? No, I, I think um, it's quite, I think it's a very easy question to answer, to be honest. Um, for me and for all of us, I think to be part of a system, be part of an organization where the um, uh, profits we make uh, actually go to a good cause. It's of course more energizing than if it would go to shareholders, to be honest. That could have been nice too, <clears throat> but it's incredibly motivating. And I think um, what you do in the foundation is to basically mirror what we stand for in IKEA to, to create a better everyday life. And sometimes people think that this is empty words or it's just beautiful words. But for us, it's real. And to see, so to say, that the dividends uh, from the profits we make goes to make good things in the world for you, it's just amazing. Thank you. Yeah, we, we share the same vision to create a better everyday life for the many people. Um, and the many people we target uh, are different than the ones you target. But together, we target a lot of people around the world and, and hopefully we're successful in doing that. <laughs> so um, it's been a tough time recently. And, I remember when you launched the first COVID-19 response plan, I was particularly struck by two things. First, you described, of course, how the company was preparing for handling the crisis with a special focus on how would you help your coworkers, how would you help the customers and the supply chain partners to survive the crisis and come through mm -hmm. stronger. But at the same time, you announced a $26 million program to support the local communities where IKEA is present. That wasn't really an obvious move. Can you explain why? Uh, well, um, to be honest, uh, one of the first uh, things that happened in uh, when uh, when Corona became pandemic uh, was that people started to act in uh, throughout IKEA at the same time. I think I actually got the question quite early from a journalist saying, uh, "How come you could be, could be so fast in uh, directing?" Um, all the good work you do, in, in, but not only internally but also externally. But the truth is that. Um, I think the, the culture and values of IKEA is there and um, uh, people acted on a very strong, uh, without having the map, we acted on with a strong uh, ethical compass, I think. And for us, it feel, feels not absolutely natural, so to say, that we look at the holistic view on society, which includes, of course, not only our own co-workers, our customers, uh, our suppliers, uh, super important, but also how could we contribute in the communities um, around us. So that started before me and my management group um, uh, got got the speed up. But what we did was uh, week two or three into it, 
we decided to sign off a package of 26 million euro to to make sure there is no budget discussions about doing the right things here. And ever since, I think people have been doing uh, big and small uh, activities, supporting local hospitals, medical centers. We've had drive-through testing centers on our parking lots, uh, supporting elderly and vulnerable groups, etc., in different ways. Um, so that's been uh, that's been amazing. Uh, that's uh, that's fantastic, and you hear so many good stories about what's happening around the world um, under that scheme. So. When I look at your crisis plan, I remember you talked to me about the first time, you, you outlined how you decided early on to see the pandemic not just as a crisis, but also as an opportunity to drive change and look for areas to improve and opportunities to accelerate development. Uh, how has that worked? Well, uh, to be honest, the, the first I think for the first weeks um, for all of us were shocking, right? Not, none of us could ever have imagined uh, a crisis that deep and that fast. Um, and uh, together with, I think, a lot of people, we were a good company in underestimating the impact, thinking that the crisis would be contained uh, to one market only. And then uh, a few weeks into the, the pandemic, so to say, we realized that we were standing before closures uh, of a business and navigating a business with, um, you know, with so many people, as you referred to, 166,000 co-workers, uh, employees with incomes, um, uh, and all these millions customers and so forth, all the networks of supplier, of course, that was uh, that was dramatic. So um, the first weeks was really about uh, being reactive and responding to the health uh, situation. Um, but we were quite quick in, I think, setting up the company in a two-paced mode with the reactive side, the crisis handling, and then the proactive um, task force approach that we've been running ever since, reviewing priorities. Uh, creating scenarios for the future. And it didn't take long until we started to bring in the discussions on what will be the uh, the coming phases, including the path to the new normal. And after that, we started the discussion to say, we're not going to accept a new normal just to happen, but we want to uh, take the opportunity to shape that future as much as we can, both from a business uh, uh, perspective and in that sense, what happened was that the uh, IKEA organization, this is, has been absolutely fascinating because the IKEA organization has been leaning forward and acting on the opportunity that we could uh, work with, and that was e-commerce. So we should have been at, um, at a low of losing more than 80% of our business. But in fact, it's almost been the opposite. R right now, we are running on uh, only lost 10% of our business in spite of US, Canada, UK, Russia, many more of our big markets being still closed. So on one hand, people acted on the opportunity of um, online and the demand was there as so many people were, were of course in their homes. Um, and secondly, which I'm sure we will talk about, there are opportunities beyond um, uh, the here and now business as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an amazing development. And I heard you talk about um, the, the openings in, in some of the markets because you're starting to open the stores again. And and mm -hmm. um, and for, for an outsider, it can mm -hmm. almost look like it's an IT, IKEA addiction going on because you've had enormous amount of people coming to the stores really wanting to come back to IKEA. Can you ex explain or tell a couple of stories about that? Well, it's, been, uh, it's been interesting because, um, again, scenario planning has been at the heart of, uh, of uh, how we lead this. Um, so that we we based on facts and good knowledge internally, externally, so to, so to say, predict the future. You can imagine supply chain decisions, um, uh, jobs, uh, etc., has to follow some sort of um, uh, orderly process. And what what we all missed in the scenario planning was how Europe, coming back to opening, uh, went into uh, euphoria. Not at all conservative, neither in visitation or in spending. And we are still scratching our heads. It's a very positive problem, to be honest. But the most important thing for me has been that, and this is not only me, but if you listen to authorities, police um, uh, authorities, other authorities around the world, we are being hailed as a good example for implementing very strict rules on um, distancing and hygiene uh, throughout all of this. Um, so it means, of course, for some customers, there's been a little bit more of waiting outside the store to get in and so on, but the um, general impression is that we manage that uh, traffic in a good way. 
and it remains our number one priority because it's of course how we take care of ourselves and our customers uh, but also it's our ticket to remain open is of course to be very very good at at the uh, safety measures that that are required well, it's nice to have positive surprises during these uh, challenging times isn't it, it can is you uh, can you say anything about uh, whether people buy the same stuff or or do you see a different trend in terms of what people bringing home after IKEA opened again? Well, to start with, it's, it's just uh, very interesting to see how interesting life at home has gone up. Uh, and it's, of course, something that we hope will remain. Um, so you can say in general there's been a boost, but uh, the first uh, segment of our range that took off was everything that had to do with work at home. You can imagine uh, that became a necessity for so many people around the world. Secondly, it took another week when people were, I think, probably running out of recipes and and uh, realizing that the cooking utensils were not good enough. So suddenly we had a spike in uh, cooking uh, as well. And I'm, I don't have any facts on it, but I'm guessing that at this moment, uh, the world is uh, um, in the average chef in the world is slightly better than than before the crisis. And then we um, we have seen everything from shoe storage to to uh, kitchens actually being planned, wardrobes being planned, and we anticipate. Even if I might be on slightly thin ice here, I don't have the facts. We anticipate that there will be a boom in everything regarding children's IKEA in a few months from now, since a lot of people have been isolated in their homes with uh, very little to do. Uh, but let's see if that comes. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Um, as you know, Jesper, I've never worked for IKEA directly, but I did have the pleasure of working very closely with uh, the founder Ingvar Kampra during the early years of the foundation. And I have come to admire the company he created a lot, especially for its strong value base, and which seems to underpin everything you do and has a strong influence on every company decision and how the company defines its role in society. So I, I believe your relentless commitment to sustainability is, is a result of that. But how will that be continued during these challenging COVID times? Yeah, it, um, on one hand, we should be humble because partly it remains to be seen. Um, but where we are at this moment, I can, I can share with you uh, that we are actually being energized by, by, uh, by the realities of uh, Corona and what that means. And I think it's partly because we see how important it is to follow our values in a time of crisis. When the sky is blue and everything is good, it's easy. But right now is the time where we need um, our ethics and our um, uh, view on why we are here uh, for real. Um, I, I have to say also there are some companies that are struggling for survival. And I can imagine that it's difficult to think long term and, and think about what your contribution in the broader context is. So all respect for that. When it comes to us, even if we are um, uh, really taking big hits uh, this year, um, we believe um, that this crisis is just a reminder on, unfortunately, now I might sound pessimistic, which is not my nature, but we stand in a decade that might be the most important in the, in the history of mankind, really. And the climate crisis will not wait for Corona. Um, of course, you can see a short term, a little bit of an impact, but the climate crisis that we stand before and we stand in, if we look at the data and our predictions, it will most likely have bigger impact on both health and economy than uh, the current situation. And as such, there is no way that we can um, look ourselves in the mirror uh, and postponing the actions that we have committed ourselves to. Uh, on the contrary, we, we will try our best uh, to stick with our commitments, speed them up where we can, and uh, uh, as a part of that, also strengthen our narrative to why we think this is important. So you had planned to um, make the fiscal year 21 uh, as a year of sustainability. That's still on, is it? That is still on. And um, the year of sustainability is um, uh, at the heart of that is a big effort in communication where typically here we, we have historically been, um, I think, a little bit low key. Uh, there is a bit of... Uh, maybe the good and the bad of the culture of being a bit uh, too humble, maybe, where, where humbleness gets reflected into silence. And silence is not a good thing these days. Uh, if you're big and if you have something good to tell, you have to step up. There's been a fear of being perceived as greenwashing, uh, 
uh, from us, like many companies. And we need to take the risks and shake that off because the stories we, we are telling is, uh, is very important for the world to hear. And it's not a story of perfection or, or I, I hope also not about being the best uh, uh, against others, but a story about inspiring customers that uh, there are affordable solutions for life at home that are sustainable, that there is hope of uh, building a value chain that is circular and that is uh, based on um, uh, smart consumption that uh, as a company, which is, I think, maybe my biggest wish for next year is that we can convince a lot of people to understand that sustainability is not charity. Sustainability is the new business model, the new low cost. And uh, to be honest, the old fossil model, the irresponsible consumption or consumption without um, limitations um, is at the end of the day, looking forward a very expensive model. We cannot be IKEA for the many people if we follow that route. I know that uh, IKEA screens potential new hires for values before they assess their technical competences. And everyone says that culture and values are important and IKEA is no exception to that, of course. But what amazes me is that it actually seems to carry it from country to country, store to store, and people are all proud of this. And the value seems to be very deeply ingrained in the organization. So what do you attribute that to? And how do you make that... Uh, come alive and, and value, how, how do you make that live in? Yeah, I'd say it's a very good question. I think when I started uh, uh, 25 years ago, a long time ago, I, I felt at very attracted by the values. I felt at ease with uh, um, the opportunity to be who I am. And at the same time, to be honest, there was a part of that also. Of course, values can be inflicting on you and saying that, can I not be who I am? Do I have to adapt myself and so on? But where I landed quite quickly and where I've been ever since is that I don't think even if IKEA has sprung from uh, the deep forests of south uh, of Sweden uh, and it has its roots, if you look at the values, they basically represent humanistic uh, approach to things that, that I think attracts people in, uh, in Russia, China, US, Germany, Sweden, etc. So I think they are very mondial, uh, the values. And... Um, and as such, they give people an opportunity of um, uh, replacing a lot of policies, rules, guidelines with just a basic instinct that if I'm following good, simple, humanistic values, I will probably be, be doing the right thing. And I think even if we have our, uh, of course, our moments as well, I think we have shown in the history that that is uh, not only stronger, uh, than a lot of other regulations to lead a company, but it's also very fast. I think personally, I think leading with values is the fastest way of leading. And you alluded to the other value, which I think is quite uh, interesting with IKEA, and that is this constant strive for improvement. You know, you, you're never totally happy. You're always looking for a way to improve, and I guess that's. That's the same thing with sustainability. You're not, say, you're not perfect. You're not saying that you're perfect, yeah. but you try to lead by example and you try to look for ways to improve. And sometimes uh, during the history, IKEA did, did something wrong or, or did something that wasn't perfect. But, you know, it's less about what you do and more about uh, how you deal with it and how you look for ways to fix it and improve on it and learn from it. And I, I yeah. see that's such an important part of, of your culture. Um, you, you refer to this uh, silence as, as not acceptable anymore. And, and mm -hmm. I, I have to admit that when I started to uh, learn about IKEA, uh, I was surprised to see all the, all the interesting business concepts and, and the, the interesting way the company operated. At the same time, nobody knew about it. Nobody heard about it. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that you have changed. You have really said, OK, if we have something that we can uh, use to encourage other businesses to to copy or 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 do like us, so we can collaborate and, and be more companies that think about the plan boundaries of the planet, for example. You you want to be actively involved, and I can see that you're much more involved in that than you, you you've been in the past. Uh, also, uh, the company as such, um, but you keep surprising uh, the world, and and you surprised the world. Uh, some years ago, with a very strong commitment to uh, become energy neutral by 2020. Yes. Which means that you produce more renewable energy than you consume worldwide. And mm -hmm. since then, I think you have invested about 2.5 billion 
euros in renewables and you own more than 500 wind turbines and you have installed almost a million solar panels on your buildings. That's a really big commitment. Yeah. I think I think it, it has a bit of an explanation, which I think is also important to know. I think I think that's one of the decisions um, um, which, when that came, I think it was about ten years ago. Personally, I was I was just super inspired by hearing it, and part of me did not fully believe it would be possible. Um, but we we managed to deliver that this year. Having that said, it's good to know that, of course, when you work with this, is one of the challenges with climate and. Uh, uh, that is that it's complex, it's many ends of it. So you have the different scopes, scope one, two, and three, and so on. And, and in this case, what we have been able to cover is an energy investment that represents more than what we consume in our operations of storage centers, distribution, etc. cetera. Um, but then when you, of course, when you extend the total impact and include the products, the raw, raw material supply chains and uh, life at home and so on, then uh, this is just one of the contributions um, of uh, many that we have done. And uh, uh, of course, that there is a lot uh, more that we need to do in order to offset every part, not only offset to, uh, in the first uh, um, uh, case, uh, structure and design ourselves to be uh, positive and then possibly also offset in the end uh, if we can't come all the way. But I think it was uh, also based on uh, our founding by Kamprad's unique approach to almost everything, but not at least um, uh, financials and independence. So what he was capable to do with the first generations of IKEA leaders was to make sure that we own our own assets and that we have assets on the bank for a rainy day. And as such, being conservative financially, it makes more sense for us to invest in fairly low return renewable energy investments as it was uh, starting 10 years ago than maybe other companies. So thereby for us, what is a good investment maybe was slightly less attractive for others. But the benefit for us is, of course, being both then renewable and having uh, solidity in our financial planning. So it's again, it shows that economy and sustainability goes perfectly well hand in hand. And of course, it secures access to energy for you in the future. It does as well. Actually, it's uh, increasingly a very good business, and that was not part of the plan from the beginning, but we will never admit that, of course. <laughs> well, you know, access to clean energy is, uh, is also a key focus area for the foundation, and uh, we try mm -hmm. to uh, make sure that when energy goes into the countryside in rural areas, that it's clean energy and not uh, fossil fuel-based energy. So um, thanks to you, we can make a lot of investments in that area as well. Mm -hmm. But one of the first things that you did as a in CASIO was to make all your country managers chief sustainability officers for their country as well. And that says everything about how important you consider this function. So can you, can you explain what you expect them to accomplish in that role? Yeah, I, I can't remember it came up with the idea. It wasn't me, but I loved it instantly. And, uh, and uh, our country managers loves it. I, I think I can speak for them and say they really love it. And it's an honor to have that role. And if you think about it, it's a, it's a bunch of... Um, uh, lovely value-based uh, business leaders who uh, all, I think, get energized by the vision to create a better everyday life for the many people, which is real for us. Now, the way we used to interpret that was uh, zooming in on life at home, making people's life at home better. But over the years, we have expanded that vision to include everybody and everything we do in our value chain. And thereby, our sustainability uh, vision is to create um, uh, and to have a positive impact on people and planet. So there is no real difference between business and sustainability any longer. And therefore, when you think about it, I think it's a fairly natural step to think that if you're a business leader today, you, you must be the leader of sustainability, not only as the right thing to do, not only the thing that our customers and coworkers expect us to do, but again, if, if you don't understand um, that we are in transformation, of a value chain where we're building a sustainable value chain and that will be a new low cost, a new way of siding with the many people, then you don't understand the future business model. So I think uh, it's a natural step for people to take it on. And, uh, and then I think people are right now enjoying exploring how they can be relevant together as a team, but also uh, in different ways in different markets, both for people and for planet. Well, Ensuring that every action taken stays within the boundaries of the planet is really something we share 
between the foundation and the business. Um, but I often say that in, in spite of the very significant amount of money that we can grant every year, thanks to you, uh, your, through the foundation, what the IKEA operation does will have more of an impact when they choose to take the lead on improving conditions and practices in, in actually the 50 countries where IKEA is present. So yeah. IKEA committed to become climate positive by 2030. That's quite mm -hmm. a challenge. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean? Yeah, I think I think that objective has grown over the years to become, I can't remember exactly how many years ago we decided uh, uh, across the, the big companies in the whole IKEA pipeline to go for that. Um, I think I think I have a huge respect for that commitment. Um, so it's both uh, inspiring me and some some days it stresses me also, of course, because the way I'm brought up, you know, a promise is a promise and promises is something you deliver. What I like with the with the promise that we have made um, is, of course, that we're not aiming to reduce or get a little bit better or compensate, but actually to take it all the way to become climate positive, to uh, reduce more uh, greenhouse gases than we emit. So that's inspiring. Um, I love that it's a 2030 goal uh, and not the 2050, etc. Because I think if you put those type of goals, you're basically handing over to the next and the next generation to deliver. And that's easy to commit uh, what somebody else should deliver. I would rather than have quicker goals and go half the way, for example. Now, what I have respect for is that we have today, we work with science-based targets. So hence, there is, this is not empty words. It's uh, calculations and the scrutiny with external organizations part of it. Um, but obviously, there are variables that are not easy for us to predict. And there are some elements that you know, we already have delivered to, that we are delivering to, but there are some gaps that we need to, uh, of course, fulfill with our plans the coming years. And um, so for me, it's like almost a positive obsession to really understand how and what will make an impact in that equation as we take it uh, forward. It is a promise. And again, so far, every step we've taken on the way has proven to give bit better business to us. Um, I mean, symbolic but still big uh, impact, like when we shifted all incandescent lighting to LED, I think we were the number one big company to do that. It didn't only have a massive impact on the scope two, three, uh, scope three, I think, uh, uh, climate, uh, we should ask experts uh, about that. But anyway, it's a real impact. And the business grew thanks to it. And we, we were the first ones to write the benefits of a new generation of lighting. Now that helped us into home smart and new type of business ventures. So again, I think uh, you have to start with believing and then after that it's hard work to be in the pole position to, to be uh, part of the new economy. Yeah, and you know, with, a, with the urgency that we see uh, on the climate change and the need to reduce uh, uh, the world's carbon footprint, I'm really glad that you said the 2030 and not the 2050, because 2050 we would definitely be too late. Yeah. And uh, you're, you're really leading the way. Let me switch to another topic, which is something that has uh, occupied both of us in, in the past. Um, you know, when the war in Syria broke out and millions of refugees were forced to flee the country, you were quick to look for ways in which IKEA could engage. And one of the countries that received actually the highest number of Syrian refugees was Jordan, with two million and a population of, of only eight million, two million Syrian refugees that came in weeks. Uh, in a situation like that, the focus had to be to expand the economy to enable refugees a chance to find a job and make a living like normal other, every other people, because fighting with the local community wouldn't be a good thing for the same jobs. So IKEA had no supply chain presence in Jordan at that time, but you were head of IKEA of Sweden at that time, which is sort of the heart of IKEA where all the business development is decided upon. And you worked with us to establish a new supply chain in Jordan to, to create jobs for Syrian and Jordanian women, creating crafts products that could be sold through mm -hmm. IKEA. So you helped expand the economy of Jordan. That was a risky venture. And I guess uh, with at best a very long-term profit perspective, uh, what made you decide to, to do this? Well, I think I trusted you, <laughs> but, but the, the, as I recall it, the, there was an initiative that uh, where you and the uh, foundation were uh, pointing at the need and linking also to, which both of us are giving credit to the support from the Jordanian uh, authorities, uh, without whom this would have been so difficult, of course. Uh, uh, 
Uh, now, and I think my role was a little bit to understanding the complexity of the uh, project was more to make sure it gets the sponsorship um, for us to really not give up, but um, um, accept the challenges one by one and then um, uh, hang in there to make this possible. Now, I, I think uh, personally, I was, I've was i been inspired always about uh, our founder, Ingvar. Uh, he was always interested of real people, people within Wallace, people with challenges rather than people who live in affluence um, and whenever we have had the opportunity in the past to side with people and uh, contribute then he has been first in the line to try to do that i had the opportunity to meet um, uh, the late professor hans rosling at um, i think uh, around that time as well and his vision on how a company or an organization like us can can contribute to create jobs and livelihood throughout the whole value chain in different ways I think, he, as in his words, that was the way to a lot of good things, to development, to peace, to prosperity. And as such, um, as a big company, I think we have a responsibility to not only address our customers and our supply chain, but also to operate in, in, uh, in other ends. Of course, IKEA Foundation is in one way then uh, addressing the needs of the most needing people in, uh, on this planet. Um, and then, then we felt that we could step in maybe one step up the ladder uh, by providing jobs then. Um, and that's what we did. And even if it's um, still a humble project in the number of people, I think it's there, it works, and it serves as, as an inspiration uh, behind, behind uh, of course, uh, or beside uh, that it provides livelihood for a lot of people. It gives hope. Uh, that last point is very important and that gets um, communicated to me all the time. The fact that you actually went in very early on and, and, and led by example and and um, and established a business there um, or a supply chain there really um, was inspiring to a lot of other companies to see that IKEA would do that. And you know, you have since uh, actually expanded your commitment to refugees across uh, 27 countries. You made a commitment to support two and a half thousand refugees with job internships in IKEA retail operation and providing them with the internships as well as different types of skills training to for them to create a basis for a future in in, in a foreign country. Um, yeah. can, can you explain why you decided to just continue with this and why do, why do you see an opportunity in this? Yeah, now also, in, also in this case, um, I realized that it was actually I, I think I've been a catalyst for something that was started by people in different um, uh, parts of uh, IKEA in response to the um, immigration crisis that took uh, place a couple of years ago uh, based on the uh, uh, Syrian crisis. So as, as Europe was overwhelmed by the situation, some people started to act on it. And, um, and then we said, our job has to be to reflect the society we are into. You know, sometimes it's not, there can be politics in this and there can be a lot of things to engage in in discussion. But, you know, for us, it is what it is. Um, and we serve everyone, right, in our community. So we felt that we need to reflect the communities we are in and we need to be part, as a big company, you have to be part of the solution. So basically the uh, schemes were developed in, uh, in Switzerland, in Germany, in other places. And we took the best of the best and created a, if you like a concept uh, for how to do that. And, and then um, there was a commitment with the retail management and all the country managers that we basically do our share in every market where it's possible, which is then uh, I think uh, more or less all of our markets uh, to then make sure that we support people with training, job training, that we on top of that employ uh, a fair share of people as well. So that is at the heart of that support. It's as you know, it's really when, when a refugee gets a job and has the opportunity to, to feed his or her family, then this is where that's when they stop being a refugee and start mm -hmm. being integrated in the new society. It's all about that opportunity and the, you're doing fantastic work to create some of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. if, if more companies and many companies could do that across Europe, we wouldn't have a refugee problem in Europe. Mm -hmm. We talked about, um, we already talked about how you decided that silence is not an option. And we can see that IKEA has become increasingly vocal about their position on a number of controversial topics in society. And um, 
and refugees being one of them, and you, you committed to being very open about uh, trying to change the narrative around refugees. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, in general, it's so important to take this risk, take the stand on issues? Would you say this is a function of the strong set of values again, or, or, or why do you think it's important for a company to stand that up? It's, it's an interesting topic because I, don't, I think it's, uh, it's one of those where it's difficult to find the black and the white in the topic. Um, it's complex and it's full of dilemmas, of course. But on one hand, you can say we had years where we were uh, silent, and we're too silent, uh, if you ask me, but we still ended up in trouble. And we were still questioned, right? Partly because we did mistakes, real mistakes, um, and partly because of um, uh, mishappenings, if you like. We had, uh, some people might remember the issue when uh, about the catalog in Saudi. Some people might remember issues connected to bad forestry and whatnot. And I, I think the, you know, at the core of the IKEA that I have been growing up with is almost perfect intentions with a couple of few exceptions maybe in the past, but very good intentions. And then still, of course, mistakes do happen. And the problem is if you don't tell your intentions and the good things you do, then people will only see you for for your mistakes and draw the wrong type of conclusion. So from a positioning point of view, I felt it's not okay uh, that uh, public opinion is not reflecting who we are, uh, but something uh, uh, tilted in that. So therefore, I think it's important. Then again, uh, when you step into this gray zone, you of course risk uh, interfering with uh, aspects of uh, politics or religion. And as we side with people, whether they're uh, Republicans or Democrats, whether they're left or right, uh, whether they're Buddhists, Muslims or Christians, there is a certain border we will not uh, uh, cross. Um, but at the same time, when we, we talk about things like climate change, um, we have once and for all decided not to engage in uh, too much discussions and debate whether it exists or not. Um, it's like we say, it's if you're in a boat which is leaking water, and some people are arguing it's not. Uh, we rather talk to the people who have um, ideas and solutions how we can uh, stop the, the leakage and how we can get the water out of the boat. So therefore, again, maybe a bit to what you said before, it's not only about sharing what we stand for, but even more important, sharing what we do and let actions be the proof point and the energy of, um, of the topic. Fantastic. As we have discussed, um, the pandemic has introduced many challenges for you, but also opportunities and for businesses all around the world, actually. So with what you know today, and things are moving very quickly, I know, and, and it's a lot of things we don't know, but, but with what you know today, um, when do you think IKEA will be back to normal or a new normal, as many would call it? And, and what will the business look like then? Well, uh, I, I think, uh... I think it's uh, we have an old uh, value in IKEA called willpower and humbleness. They go very good together, I think. Uh, uh, too much of only humbleness doesn't help you move things, and too much of willpower without the other uh, is also not good. But I, I think, um, if anything, we have learned to be uh, humble to what we don't know, and uh, therefore it's so difficult to make the predictions. What I think we're discussing now is that possibly the span of uh, uh, of uh, influence that we have ourselves is bigger than we thought by acting on our opportunities, for example, online, etc. The needs in life at home and so forth. Um, even through, let's let's assume that um, uh, it would be strange if the economy this fall would be stronger than before Corona. So let's accept that uh, we are heading towards tougher times. But as such, also there will most likely be more people who need to turn their uh, coins. Uh, in order to make their decisions. And that's also where IKEA uh, turns out to be quite good. Now, I, I think um, from a um, corporate perspective, I think we lose one year in our progression, but that's not too bad. You know, we can absolutely live with that. The, 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 the biggest challenge for us is, of course, if we retract, and of course, nothing is average on some markets more, uh, uh, being a very people-centric uh, uh, business, uh, it's very difficult to protect all the jobs. So I think one of the focus areas has been for many weeks and will be the weeks to come to act on opportunities uh, to drive growth, but also to see how we can uh, reskill, upskill, train people uh, and take opp act on opportunities in order to 
ensure as many jobs as possible. So this is like more important maybe than the exact number when it comes back. But then uh, I think next year will um, probably be, we will probably be back at the uh, same level, similar levels. And that has also to do with that the strategies we had pre-corona was to reach out to many more people through digital solutions, new ways of entering city centers, services, better uh, products and so forth. So I think that would probably uh, put us back on track in a year from now. So in your view, the future is bright, is it? Of course it is. That's decided. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I have, we had a lot of questions from, uh, from um, viewers and listeners, and uh, we don't uh, have the time to go through. But it was a question I wanted to, to pose to you before we end up here. And uh, that was a question from John Callender, who asked, going circular required us all to be more collaborative. How does IKEA plan to do this, and what help does it require? Very good. I think um, I think the answer is in the question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, circularity, when you start to understand that per definition, it's very difficult for anyone to solve, um, um, you know, an organization without authorities, uh, et cetera, it's not going to work. So I think maybe the insight lately for us is that we have confused uh, uh, things a little bit with circularity. Circularity is a solution, it's not an objective. Um, uh, the objective is sustainable consumption. Um, and again, to, to think that consumption would be uh, bad uh, in general is also, I think, not helping because human beings will consume. People will have homes, um, a place to sleep and eat and, and so forth. Uh, so the question is, how do you create sustainable consumption? And it's not the only solution, but circularity is one of the uh, solutions that will be needed. And IKEA has actually since many years been working on, uh, you know, medium, small parts of uh, making sure we use the right material uh, and that we start to circulate things like paper, plastic and so on. Um, it, there are live examples, for example, in Sweden, that shows how society is very high on the percentage of capability of uh, taking care of um, reversed flows, for example. But what IKEA will do, we will continue to engage in this. We will. Uh, continue to because we own our offer, well, our range of products, so we can determine the content, uh, material separability, etc. Uh, has already been implemented uh, across most areas, um, and since we're big, or in several areas, we can invest in reverse flows, like we do in mattresses now in in many places, um, and so on. So we're going to engage in that with our own money, and where we are too small, we will engage with the authorities and other companies to try to put an 80-20 approach on um, on reverse flows, where it makes sense. That's an exciting outlook. It is. Hey, Jesper, if we had been together in the same room today, we would have started with a hug, right? Because we that's, typ that's typical for the IKEA culture. So it will be probably be a while before we can start hugging each other again. So have you found an alternative in, in the meantime? Well, you know what? I think this about recognition is so important, and, and that's what hugging is all about. And our founder used to say, and also it's um, it's uh, for free. Uh, he was very cost conscious. Uh, but uh, th this hug, virtual hug, is also for free. But it's uh, sincere. And uh, I'm super excited that um, having the opportunity to join you, Pal, and share a little bit more of what we do and how we think. So uh, also a big thank you to you and a big virtual hug. <laughs> OK. Yes, Bert, thanks for being on Ask an Expert today and good luck with your very ambitious plans to create an even better everyday life for even more people in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks both of you and uh, really this was such an inspiring session and I can see by all the comments that we've seen on LinkedIn and YouTube and Facebook that so many co-workers and, uh, and other people who are not working for IKEA have been very, very inspired hearing you both. I know I am. Uh, I'm always inspired when we really talk about it and you can just sit, you can really feel the IKEA values and I think that's one thing that I always take away is you know the IKEA values have such depth and as Paris said you can feel them every single uh, place you go into and, and now it's not just stores but it's everyone's living rooms so thank you so much for from your living rooms taking some time to speak to us uh, just so everyone knows next week we're back talking about food the hidden key to landscape restoration and a planet positive future and we're actually going to have someone from Inter-IKEA Food join us as well for that. So make sure you tune in next week. Uh, and for uh, everyone else, again.
Thank you. Jesper, Pear? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.